Today's podcast is sponsored by Indeed. Indeed makes it easy to connect with your applicants. No need to install anything extra. Indeed's virtual interviews work from your own browser. So start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Peter. Offer valid through April 30th. I'm recording this podcast on Tuesday after the markets have closed for trading. And earlier today, the yield on the 30-year U.S. Treasury got above 3% for the first time since April of 2019. Now, we didn't close above 3%. We closed at 2 spot 99. The intraday high was 3.018. Now, the 10 year didn't make it up to 3%, but it closed above 2.9%. This is the high for this move. We're at 2 spot 913 on the 10 year. By the way, the yield curve is not inverted anymore. The further out you go, the higher yields are, although the separation is still very narrow. And though I have been talking about the inversions of these yield curves and have speculated that we may actually get a complete inversion all the way from the 2s to the 30s, we haven't had that yet. And if it does happen, I think it's an aberration. I think it's a head fake because the only reason we don't have a much bigger positive slope in the yield curve is because everybody believes that we're headed for a recession. Recession means that not only will the Fed slash interest rates, but that it also means an end to inflation. The market has this completely wrong. As a matter of fact, the last time 30-year Treasury yields were at 3%, which again was April in 2019. If you look at what the inflation rate was, the year-over-year increase in CPI, it was 1.8%. So that means when 30-year Treasury yields were 3%, you at least got a 1.2% real yield above the current 12-month year-over-year inflation rate. And also, by the way, inflation was trending down because earlier in the year and later in 2018, we had inflation prints year-over-year that were north of 2%. So inflation was already coming down when yields were above 3%. Fast forward to today, when we finally have 3% 30-year yields again, but the year-over-year increase in the CPI is 8.5%, but it's also 8.5% and rising, not 1.8% and falling. But that also means that rather than having 1.2% positive real interest rates, we have minus 5.5% of negative real interest rates. Now, of course, the actual rate of negative interest rates is much greater because the real inflation rate is much higher than 8.5. Now, that was also the case back in April of 2019 when we were reporting a inflation rate of 1.8. It was probably closer to 5% even back then, which meant we had negative real yields back in 2019, but they're just much more negative now But if you accept the government's BS version of inflation, we had 1.2% real rates in April of 2019. Well, in order to have 1.2% real rates now, the yield on the 30-year U.S. Treasury has to go to 9.7%. Now, nobody thinks a yield like that is even possible, let alone probable. And I think that's one of the reasons that we actually had a 500-point rally in the Dow Jones today, even with new highs in Treasury yields. And the S&P 500 had an even bigger move. It was up over 70 points, 1.61%. The Dow's move was 1.45%. The NASDAQ also had a decent day, up better than 1%, 1.2%. But the very speculative stocks like Kathy Wood, ARK Innovation, that fund was up just over 4% on the day. And I think one of the reasons that you had so much enthusiasm for the stock market, despite the rise in yields, is because everybody is talking about the increase coming to an end, that we've already seen peak inflation 
And this is about as high as interest rates are going to go. After all, about 3% is where we topped out in the past. And so we're probably topping out there now. Now, first of all, a lot of the analysts who are proclaiming that 3% is the high never thought yields would get to 3% in the first place. Most of the analysts, so-called experts out there, had figured that the yields would top out somewhere below 2.5%. So the fact that they got to 3% is already something that none of these guys expected. And now that it's happened, they're convinced that this is the top. Well, as I just mentioned, if rates topped out at 1.2% real in 2019, why would they top out at negative 5.5 now? Why wouldn't investors similarly demand a real return on their money when they're making a 30-year loan? Why would they be content to accept 5.5% losses for the next 30 years. Now, obviously, they're not going to do that. So to the extent that anybody is buying a 30-year treasury, they expect inflation to quickly move back down below 2%. But there is no indication that that would be the case. In fact, all of the information that's out there would suggest that inflation is going to continue to get worse. And even if it does improve, it's not going to go anywhere near the 1.8% percent it was in April of 2018, we'll probably never even see 2%. I don't even know that we'll even see 4% on any point year over year going forward. We're going to have much higher inflation for the rest of this decade than we had in the prior decade. And it was that extra low inflation that was the only reason the Fed was able to keep interest rates as low as they were. But given a much higher inflationary environment that we're going to be living in in the future, there's no way that interest rates can stay this low. And so the markets are completely wrong in taking comfort in the fact that they think rates have peaked. We're just getting started. Yield on a 30-year bond is headed to 4%, then 5%, and it's going to keep on rising. Again, the only thing that's going to stop that is going to be a Fed pivot on rate hikes and a return to quantitative easing, even though quantitative easing hasn't even ended yet because the balance sheet is still expanding. In theory, they're going to start contracting the balance sheet in May. Well, the only way to stop bond yields from rising, at least in the short run, would be to do more QE, but nobody is talking about that now. Not even the biggest doves on the FOMC are talking about returning to QE. In fact, yesterday in an interview with Jim Bullock, he was talking about getting rates up to three and a half percent on the Fed funds by the end of this year. Remember, we're at a quarter of a percent right now. The range is 0.25 to 0.5, and Bullard is talking about three and a half by the end of the year. And we're already well into the second quarter, so that's a lot of hikes. Bullard was talking about not ruling out 75 basis point rate hikes, let alone 50 basis point rate hikes. So when the Fed is talking about these type of rate hikes, there is nothing to stop the bond market from falling. And if Bullard is correct, and they actually get the Fed funds up to 3.5% by the end of the year, where do you think the yield on a 30-year treasury is going to be? It's not going to be 3%. It'll be at least 5, 5.5%. And if 30-year treasury yields are 5.5%, where do you think mortgage yields are going to be? They're probably at a new high today. They might be at around five and a quarter right now. I haven't seen them, but they were 5.15 yesterday, and that was before today's increase. But if we're 225 basis points above the 30-year bond yield, and 30-year bond yields are five and a half, you're talking about around an 8% mortgage rate. How are consumers going to afford to pay 8% mortgage? How are all the people with these adjustable rate mortgages that are going to be resetting over the next year going to afford to make the payments when you have this big an increase in interest rates? They're not. They're going to have to be cutting back their spending everywhere they can. The entire economy that is levered to the hilt is going to have to cut back dramatically on everything in an inflationary rising interest rate environment, which is why this economy is headed into recession and not just a shallow recession, but a severe deep recession, which is why all these rate hikes aren't actually going to come to fruition because the Fed is going to have to reverse course once it understands just how badly the economy is going to respond 
to just the talk of raising interest rates, let alone what would happen when the Fed actually gets around to doing it. In fact, one example of what's coming is Netflix, which reported its earnings after the bell, and so it hasn't had an impact yet on the markets. I expect it to have a big impact on the markets on Wednesday, but Netflix came out and reported its first ever quarterly subscriber loss. They lost 200,000 subscribers on the quarter. Now, 700,000 of the loss was from Russia because part of the Russia sanctions, I think was in March, they basically canceled all the Netflix accounts out of Russia and that was 700,000 subscribers. So, but for that, they would have gained 500,000. But the expectations from investors was for a gain of 2.5 million subscribers. So it was a huge miss, but probably more significant, Netflix is forecasting that in the current quarter, they are going to lose 2 million subscribers. And again, analysts had been expecting another 2.5 million new subscribers gained during the quarter. So that is an even bigger miss. That is why the stock is trading down 26% after hours. It's now about 62% below last year's high. This is the worst performing of the FANG stocks. This is the N in FANG. It was also one of the greatest stay-at-home stocks during COVID because everybody just assumed that COVID would, I guess, go on indefinitely and people were going to continue to subscribe to Netflix. But what is happening to Netflix now is indicative of what is going to be happening to a lot of other companies during this inflationary recession. Because the big problem cited by Netflix is the fact that a lot of their household subscribers are sharing their accounts with other households. And so Netflix is basically getting ripped off by its customers who are effectively stealing its service. Well, what do you expect in this type of environment where people are doing everything they can to cut back expenses? Remember, I've been talking about the fact that as an investor, I want to own companies that are selling products that people need, not products that people want because you only buy the products that you want after you're finished buying all the products that you need. Nobody needs to subscribe to Netflix. In fact, if you have a friend that has Netflix, you can easily share their subscription. I think when you subscribe, you get five users, I think, with a subscription, or maybe there's a tier. But I know I subscribe, and I think we can have five devices simultaneously, which means several friends could use my account without paying for it, and it wouldn't impact my ability to use my account as well. I think this phenomenon is going to continue to expand. I don't know how Netflix is going to crack down on it unless it just reduces the number of screens that you're able to watch at any one time. They might do that, but in so doing, they're probably going to end up losing subscribers not gaining them because I think people will not like the fact that the wife and the husband can't both watch it or the kids can't watch something while the husband's watching something. So I think a degradation in quality would also be a problem. But of course, that degradation of quality is something that won't show up in the CPI because the extent that Netflix reduces the quality of your service, that's not going to show up as a price increase, even though it effectively is because you get less service for your money, but also I think a much bigger problem that Netflix is going to have is that a lot of people are only going to subscribe to Netflix maybe for one month or two months out of the entire year because you can binge watch whatever it is you like on Netflix and then when you're finished watching, you can cancel a service so you can subscribe to another service for a month that has the program that you want. You see, what's happened because of the success of Netflix and oftentimes in capitalism, companies become victims of their own success. Because Netflix was so successful, so many other companies copy that business model and now you have so many different streaming services competing for the same group of customers. And those customers are now spending more money on food, more money on rent, more money on energy, so they have less and less money in order to use 
to subscribe to all these services that they want so they have less money to divvy up among a greater number of streaming services. So they have to figure out which ones they're going to eliminate and they're going to have to find ways to economize only using the services for a shorter period of time. Don't pay for the entire year when you don't need it for the entire year. And I think people are going to do everything they can to share services with their friends. Hey, you subscribe to Netflix. I'll subscribe to Disney Plus. Maybe another family subscribes to the Peacock Network or Paramount or whatever, or somebody else takes Hulu and then they just share. And the more consumers are pressed to try to economize and struggle to make ends meet, companies like Netflix are going to continue to be the victims of this type of standard of living downsizing, which is going to happen. And of course, how is Netflix likely to respond to this? Because now they're not going to be able to get the type of growth that they got before. So if they want to grow the top line, if they can't grow their subscribers, the only thing they can do is raise their prices. And I think not only will Netflix be trying to make up for a loss of subscriber growth by increasing prices, but a lot of these other streaming services are going to do the same thing. And ultimately, they're all going to start eating into their own growth because consumers just don't have the capacity to pay for all these services, especially when their incomes are declining at the rate they are. Are you ready to take your business to the next level? You're going to need the right team to make it happen. Indeed makes it easy to hire and build a team with the right skills to make your dreams a reality. If you're hiring, then you need Indeed because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applicants that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed partners with you on every step of the hiring process. You can find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match assessments and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a job post, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applicants that meet your must-have requirements. And Indeed delivers four times the hires than all the other job sites combined, according to TalentNet. So join the more than 3 million businesses worldwide that already use Indeed to hire great talent fast. In fact, that's what I love most about Indeed is that it simplifies the hiring process and lets you do it all in one place. That's especially true when it comes to the virtual interviews, which can save you a lot of valuable time. You can message, schedule, and interview top talent seamlessly all in one place. Indeed makes it easy to connect with your applicants. No need to install anything extra. Indeed's virtual interviews work from your browser. Indeed saves you headaches. You can interview virtually with no downloads, plugins, or purchases. You can do it all in one place with Indeed. So start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Peter. Offer valid through April 30th. Just go to Indeed.com slash Peter to claim your $75 credit before April 30th. Indeed.com slash Peter. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. And of course, if you look at the actual statistics, wages are rising something like 4 or 5% and the official CPI is 8.5%. And so people talk about real incomes declining 2 3% a year and how that's a problem. But in reality, it's a much bigger problem because the wage numbers are real. Those are actual numbers because they're easy to measure. There is no hedonics. There is no substitution. The wage increases are accurate. It's the price increases that are not. Because if inflation is actually 17 or 18 percent, not eight and a half percent, but wages are only growing by four or five percent, real incomes are collapsing at an unprecedented rate. In fact, if you look at the U.S. household savings rate, it has completely imploded this year. It's now lower than it was prior to all the COVID stimmy and PPP checks going out. We had a big spike in the savings rate because the government sent everybody a bunch of cash 
and they really had no way of spending it because they were locked down at home. But then they started dipping into that slush fund. And now not only is it completely gone, they actually have less savings than they had before they got that government slush fund because they spent up that money on rising prices. And now that money is gone and they're relying on credit cards to fill the gap between what they earn and what they spend. But this is an unprecedented decline in the real earnings of American households and they have to cut back everywhere they can. And this is gonna be especially true for people who have these adjustable rate mortgages because most of these mortgages that reset and people had five-year arms, right? Where you had your mortgage was fixed for five years and then it resets and it, usually there's a cap. And whatever the market rate is, they can't go all the way up to that rate, but they can go up two full percentage points which is big. So if someone had a rate of 3% and now they have a rate of 5%, that's a huge jump in their monthly payments. Where's the money going to come from? It's going to come from a canceled Netflix subscription or all sorts of other business models like that. Now, maybe this dose of reality is going to sink into the NASDAQ tomorrow where you have all these companies that are priced for growth. Not only are they not going to get growth, they're actually going to see a reduction in their business and so the stocks are priced for perfection and what we're actually getting is the opposite of that there is still a long way down to go for all these stocks because they were overpriced but the fact that earnings are not even coming close to expectations these stocks need to be marked down in a much bigger way but not only is it the earnings that are going to result in the markdown but the fact that interest rates are not peaking 3% 3% on a 30-year treasury, 2.9-ish on a 10-year. We are still closer to the bottom than the top. Remember, we had a 40-year bull market in treasuries. Now we're probably in a bear market that will last at least a decade, if not more. And we are just coming off the lows. These yields would have been record lows, and they were a few years ago when we got down there for the first time. So we are coming off the lowest bond yields in recorded history. There's never been a point in time in the history of the world where governments were able to borrow money this cheap. That is over. That is coming to an end. And probably the poster boy of borrowing cheap is Japan. And a disaster is already playing out in slow motion in Japan. I talked about this on an earlier podcast, how America would be turning Japanese. Well, right now, I think Japan is about to turn into a real life version of a monster movie. Only instead of Godzilla destroying Tokyo, it's going to be debt. It's going to be inflation. The Japanese yen is now down for a record 13 consecutive days. You have a 12% decline now in the value of the yen versus the dollar this year. Now, imagine what's happening to prices in Japan for all these commodities, agriculture commodities, energy commodities that are all priced in dollars. As much as those costs are going up for Americans, They're going up even more for the Japanese because you have to tack on that extra 12% for the loss of the value of the yen. And what really kicked this decline into a higher gear, and I talked about it on that podcast, was the Bank of Japan drawing a line in the sand when it comes to interest rates on 10-year Japanese government bonds. Remember, the Bank of Japan said that they will do whatever it takes. They will print as much money as need be to keep the yield on 10-year Japanese government bonds at a quarter of a percent, 0.25. Now, inflation in Japan, I think officially, is already close to 2%, but it's going to blow through that number by the end of the year. Japan is probably going to finish this year with inflation significantly higher than 2%. We could be 5%. Who knows? We could be even higher than that. We have a huge inflation problem in Japan. But Japan has a bigger problem in that they accumulated so much debt trying to create inflation 
Because the Bank of Japan claimed that Japan didn't have enough inflation, they pursued a monetary policy to create inflation. But in so doing, they also created an economy that would implode the minute inflation actually reared its head. So if they ever succeeded in creating the inflation they claimed they needed, they would actually usher in an even bigger problem. And that's exactly what's happened. Because the Bank of Japan, instead of claiming victory and saying, oh, great, we finally have enough inflation. I guess we could turn off the faucet. We don't need any more water, right? We can let interest rates go up. We can stop creating inflation because we've succeeded now. We have all that we need. Instead of doing that, the Bank of Japan said, "Uh uh-oh, now we need even more inflation. Because inflation is higher, we need even more of it because we can't let interest rates rise because the government of Japan will not be able to pay the interest on the debt if we allow interest rates to rise to an appropriate level, given the fact that we're now living with all the inflation that we deliberately created. So they told the markets, we're going to keep on printing money. Well, that's the worst thing you can tell a bond investor who's already worried about too much inflation. If you are in Japan and you're selling Japanese government bonds because you're worried about inflation and the yields are too low and the Bank of Japan's response is, We're going to create even more inflation. We're going to print money and buy those bonds. Well, now more people who own those bonds have an even greater incentive to dump those bonds. And that's what everybody, I believe, in Japan is doing. They want to avoid the future losses of having the real value of their Japanese government bonds destroyed by inflation. So they're taking the Bank of Japan up on its offer to buy those overpriced treasuries. So everybody is selling. Where does the Bank of Japan get the yen to buy those treasuries? Creates it out of thin air, quantitative easing. Well, the more yen they create to buy the JGBs no one wants, the more everybody who still owns them wants to sell because they have to create even more inflation to buy those JGBs. And so it's a vicious circle that is not going to stop. You're going to have this huge outbreak of inflation in Japan. And this potentially could set out a global financial crisis because Japan can't sit back and watch the yen be destroyed and wipe out the savings of everyone in Japan. There are a lot of savings in Japan. It's not like the United States. You can't wipe out the savings of the Japanese. That would lead to a disaster. So at some point, and maybe before the end of the year, these inflation numbers are going to be so bad that the Bank of Japan is going to have to bite the bullet and let interest rates go way up. They're not just going to let them go up a little. They're going to have to go up a lot. And that is going to have major ramifications throughout the world because Japan has been the center of cheap money. No bonds have been lower than Japanese bonds. And the Bank of Japan has kept interest rates lower than all these other central banks. And they've been one of the main sources of order liquidity. Well, when that all dries up, when all of a sudden yields in Japan shoot up to the point where Japan is offering the highest rates in the world, not the lowest rates in the world. And believe me, in order to stop inflation, that's what they're going to have to do. That's going to have serious ramifications in Japan for the Japanese government and spending cuts or tax increases, but it's going to force interest rates up all over the world. And where that's going to have an even bigger shock wave is here in the United States, because the United States is the most vulnerable nation to a surge in interest rates. The U.S. was able to benefit from the artificially low rates in Japan because our rates didn't look that bad in comparison. But when the Japanese yields rise above U.S. yields and then the yen starts to reverse these losses and starts to soar, that is going to be a huge problem for the U.S. economy, for the U.S. bond market, for the U.S. dollar. In fact, one of the reasons that the price of gold fell today, it was down about 25 bucks. And by the way, yesterday, gold went above 2000 for the first time since January. Now, it didn't close above 2000 In fact, it surrendered most of its gains. It still managed to close positive on the day. Although during that sell-off, most of the gold and silver mining stocks, many which hit new 52-week highs in the morning, ended up closing negative on the day. And when gold was down about 25 bucks today, we had pretty solid selling across the board in gold and silver stocks. But one of the reasons that gold went down was because we had another big down day in the Japanese yen. Japanese yen was perceived as a safe haven. 
And by going down, it was driving down other safe havens like gold, like the Swiss franc. The Swiss franc has also been weakening along with the Japanese yen. But once they have to raise interest rates in Japan, that is going to have huge implications for the price of gold. Because when the yen starts rising against the dollar, that is going to be very bullish for the gold price in terms of U.S. dollars because the weak yen has been one of the headwinds for gold. Now, gold has been able to make this move despite having to deal with the headwind of a weak yen. But once it has the tailwind of a strong yen, you're going to see a much faster increase in the price of gold. And of course, eventually, the Federal Reserve is going to have to pivot. It is going to have to acknowledge the underlying weakness in the economy which it's currently denying exists. In fact, I mentioned Bullard's talk the other day, and while he was talking about jacking interest rates up to 3.5% before the end of the year, he was also talking about the strength of the economy, that we have a fundamentally strong economy, and there's no reason that this strong economy can't handle 3.5% interest rates. The economy couldn't handle 2.5% interest rates in the fourth quarter of 2019. And structurally, the economy was in much better shape then than it was now. It's just that Bullard doesn't understand the difference between a bubble and a strong economy because what the Fed has inflated is a bubble. Maybe these guys think their monetary policy actually created a vibrant, sustainable, growing economy. It did not. They are clueless to their own creation. All they did is inflate the mother of all bubbles. And you can't sustain the mother of all bubbles unless you have the mother of all easy money policy for it to feed on. And Bullard wants to remove the food. It wants to take away the very lifeblood of this bubble, deprive it of the air that it needs to continue to expand. And what's happened with Netflix, this is just, again, a small taste of what all sorts of U.S. businesses are going to be experiencing both prior to and during this recession because people have to cut back on their spending. They have no choice. And eventually, businesses are going to cut back on their employees. They're going to have no choice either. Businesses are going to be under the same type of pressures that households are. Businesses have debt. They're going to have to economize. Businesses are facing higher costs. They're going to have to figure out how they can reduce those costs. And one of the costs that they're going to be trying to reduce is going to be labor, especially since so many workers are demanding raises. After all, their cost of living is skyrocketing far more than the official numbers would reflect. People want to be paid for their work. And so they're demanding more money. And so a lot of employers may decide, you know what? The only way I can keep these workers is if I pay them more money. I'm going to have to figure out how I can get by with fewer workers because if I want any workers, I'm going to have to pay them more money. So I'm going to have to figure out how to pay some workers more money. Well, the only way to do that is to pay other workers no money by laying them off. So the layoffs are coming. Price increases are coming. There is no way that this bubble can survive rising interest rates. I don't understand why the FOMC members still don't understand the nature of the very bubble economy that they created. All of this stuff that they think we have going for us is all a direct result of artificially low interest rates. You can't raise interest rates back up and expect everything that you built on that false foundation to stay levitated in midair. It has to come collapsing down. Now, maybe some of the people on the FOMC, maybe they know this. Maybe they just lie about it. Maybe they knew that the subprime market wasn't contained, or maybe they knew that inflation wasn't transitory, but they lied about it because they didn't want to tell the truth. And so maybe there's a lot of things that they know are true that they're lying about today for the same reason they lied about them in the past. Now, the alternative is they weren't lying in the past. They actually believed that subprime was contained. They were just so incompetent to think that. And they actually were incompetent enough to believe that inflation was transitory. So if they're telling us now that we have this strong economy that can sustain rising interest rates, well, either they're lying or they're incompetent. But the same thing is going to happen again. The Fed has got it wrong. But because the Fed has it wrong, and not just the Fed, so many investors have this wrong. 
they still believe the Fed and they're still afraid to go out on a limb and assume an outcome that is opposite of what the consensus expects. But that's why we still have such a good opportunity as investors to capitalize on the ignorance of the vast majority of investors that we're competing with. Because that means assets continue to be mispriced. You still have these momentum, highly speculative assets that are overpriced, and you have a lot of assets, value, dividend paying, commodity, and other assets that people ignored during the mania that remain underpriced to this day. Even though a lot of the prices have improved from where they were at the beginning of the year, they haven't improved nearly enough to the point where these stocks are not good investment values, especially when the dollar not only surrenders its Russia invasion of the Ukraine gains, but actually ends up with some real losses, which would have already befell the dollar, but for the Russia invasion of Ukraine. The dollar was starting to go down on record budget deficits. It's just this geopolitical uncertainty that has temporarily benefited the dollar, but ultimately is going to hurt the dollar dramatically, may even be the straw that breaks the back of the dollar's reserve currency status by really highlighting the risks that the world faces by leaving the U.S. with the reserve currency. And by the way, the sanctions themselves may even backfire apart from highlighting the reasons that the world needs to move away from the dollar. The sanctions may end up benefiting Russia because to the extent that Russia still manages to circumvent these sanctions because it finds willing buyers who need what it's got to sell and who are willing to pay if they can still sell their energy or sell their agricultural commodities, look at the prices they're getting. The value of everything Russia produces and sells is going way up. And so they may end up earning more as a result of these sanctions, not less. So who knows? The sanctions may actually end up prolonging the war, not bringing it to a quicker end. And by the way, when gold was moving above 2000, Bitcoin was moving below 40,000. In fact, on Monday, Bitcoin traded below 39,000 before recovering a good portion of those losses. And then today, Bitcoin enjoyed another big rally along with the stock market. In fact, we almost got up to 42,000, I think 41,700 and change. As I'm recording the podcast, it's now around 41,400. But what was interesting about the way Bitcoin traded over the holiday weekend was that the entire time that Bitcoin was trading, but when all the other financial markets were closed, Bitcoin stayed above 40,000. But as soon as the markets opened in Asia for both equities and gold, we saw a sell-off in NASDAQ futures and a rise in the price of gold. Gold immediately moved up about $15. NASDAQ futures were down 1%. And when that happened, Bitcoin just tanked because as soon as Bitcoin had the opportunity to react to other markets, it did exactly what it's been doing. It followed risk assets lower and did the opposite of gold as a safe haven. And in fact, it did the same thing again today. As risk assets rebounded on Tuesday, NASDAQ stocks, regular stocks went up. Bitcoin went up too. What went down today? Gold, Japanese yen, Swiss franc. Again, more evidence that Bitcoin is not even close to being a safe haven. It's not digital gold at all. Apart from the fact that it doesn't enjoy any of gold's physical properties, it doesn't even mimic gold as a financial asset because it moves in the opposite direction of gold. So if all Bitcoin is, is a risk asset, well, then what's its purpose? Because you have lots of other risk assets that you can buy that will go up and down with the NASDAQ, but that fundamentally have a lot more to them. They have a lot less downside risk because they may not go to zero and they probably have a lot more upside potential because they represent actual businesses that can grow instead of just a digital token that only depends on new users coming in. And as I described earlier, when it comes to Netflix, What was powering Netflix? The idea that subscribers would always grow, that there'd always be more and more people that wanted to use Netflix. Well, that's not happening anymore. 
Fewer people want to use Netflix because they'd rather use their friend's account for free or they've got so many other streaming services to compete with, they just don't have enough money to buy Netflix and everything else, so they have to make choices, and so this is a problem. Well, you got almost 19,000 cryptocurrencies competing with Bitcoin. So you got a lot more choices when it comes to crypto than it comes to streaming services. And eventually the number of people who are going to choose Bitcoin is going to diminish. In fact, eventually there's not going to be anybody who wants Bitcoin, at least in relation to the number of people who already have Bitcoin that want out. And once you have more people who want out than new people coming in, the whole thing implodes, especially since the people who want out are probably going to want out with much bigger dollar volumes than the new people who want in. And so you'll have more people getting out than getting in. But the people who are going to get out are going to be trying to unload a lot more Bitcoin than the people who are willing to get in are able to afford. And so supply overwhelms demand and the market's going to implode. Thank you.